Well, it's nice to be with all you miners. I thought that they were going to give you guys a, uh, you know, a, a mining hat as part of the weekend package. Guess that didn't work out, huh? Okay. So back in, the, I think, the 1970s, before any of you were born, there's a guy named Neil Young. And I guess he was looking for a girlfriend. And he wrote a song called, I Want to Find That Girl with a Heart of Gold. Well, uh, I've robbed Neil of his song, baptized it into Christianity. And it's all about God's heart of gold, which is Jesus. And you and I are the miners for the heart of gold. So. Father's mystery revealed in history keeps me searching for his heart of gold as the prophets told in Christ are hidden mysteries untold you gotta do that kind of thing you know oh, ho, 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 ho. I just want to know him all right, that's the way it goes. Try it. How many of you have ever heard that song before? In a slightly different version, right? Okay. I want to live. He wants to give. I am a miner for his heart of gold. The Father's mystery revealed in history. Keeps me searching for his heart of gold. That prophet's told, sorry. In Christ are hidden mysteries untold. I just want to know. He keeps me searching for his heart of gold. The more I see, the more I want to know. I read his holy book, I took a good look. I've seen that Jesus is God's heart of gold. All God's affections in his direction. Now I'm a miner for his heart of gold. I just want to know. No greater treasure than his heart of gold just want to know each vein of mystery hidden long ago creation's treasure hidden long ago knowledge and wisdom treasured more than gold the more i dig the more the spirit shows he keeps me searching for his heart of gold I just want to know. All right, fellow miners. You got to dig. Gold valuable, you got to dig. You find some on the surface, like those San Francisco 49ers. You know why that football team is called the 49ers, right? Because in 1849, there was a gold rush around San Francisco. They were searching. All right, now. Now, I'm, I'm thankful to uh, the Saints in Toronto. Back a few years ago, I, I wrote this song for a, a, a Toronto Youth Conference. And then I saw the words the other day, and I said, hey, wait, they, we, can, we can do this. And then uh, I couldn't remember the tune. But fortunately, the 
folks up in Toronto, never forget. This goes like this. I praise you for I am fearfully made. I praise you for I am wonderfully made. Try it. I praise you for I am fearfully made. I praise you for I am wonderfully made. You searched me and you've known me. It's too wonderful for me. You form me in my mother's womb. I'm known intimately. I praise you for, for I am fearfully made. I praise you for I am wonderfully made. You know me, my ways completely. You see my faults and fears. Before I speak, you hear me. No secrets hid from thee. I praise you for I am fearfully made. I praise you for I am wonderfully made. My wanderings you follow. Where can I flee from thee? If I run away, you seek me out. My bed in hell, you see. I praise you for I am fearfully made. I praise you for I am wonderfully made. You're all around and in me, behind me and before. Your hands of love surround me, my broken heart restores. I praise you, O oh Lord. I praise you, O oh Lord. I praise you for I am fearfully, I am wonderfully made. Yes. And we'll talk about why we're going to sing that song tonight. But now we go on to the last one. <clears throat> this is a, the tune to uh, The Morning is Broken. I have a treasure living inside me, lighting my spirit, whispering his word. Jesus, my treasure, love without measure, indwelling shepherd, forever friend. Treasure of treasures in earthen vessels, clean out the idols. treasure in me cries of a father helping to keep his throne in my heart let's try it one more time this is a just a little prayer worship that i sing to the lord i have a treasure living inside me Lighting my spirit, whispering his word. Jesus, my treasure, love without measure. Indwelling shepherd, forever friend. Treasure of treasure. idols hid in my heart. The treasure in me cries of a father helping me keep thrown in my heart. 
it's so wonderful that we have the Lord within our hearts and He cries out every once in a while, Abba, Father, at a time when we don't know what to do. Or He's ever present there trying to help us and especially in this way to keep His throne in our hearts. Lord, we all acknowledge that this is a, a great problem for us. But we are so glad that we are gathered with others who are treasure seekers, who, who know that Jesus is the treasure. And Lord, we just are asking for help this weekend in how we might find Him and enjoy Him forever. Indeed, for this reason we were created, to worship and serve our God and to enjoy Him forever. So we pray that you'll help us to do that even more as we're gathered together this wonderful evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Oops. Good job, good job. All right. <clears throat> so, of course, we're dealing with Christ our treasure. That's the theme for the weekend. My question, of course, because of this uh, scripture in Psalm 139, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, how complicated are you? Hmm. I mean, you're meant to be indwelt by our Lord. But it turns out that we are the greatest problem in finding our treasure. Turns out. So what does David mean by fearfully and wonderfully made? So, I'm going to take a little test here. Here's four temperaments. They're called the shape of the soul. Now, your, your temperament is the shape of your soul. Uh, this is you one way, this way. Now, look at those four pictures, because one of those is you. Choose the one. They're all very beautiful guys. Uh, Hippocrates, in the 6th century B.C., came up with these four different temperaments or types of personalities. And uh, in him and Dr. Galen, who came later on among the Romans, decided it was because of how many juices were going through your system. So the phlegmatic was somebody who had a lot of phlegm, you know. <laughs> Because in the wintertime, because they have so much phlegm, they're phlegmatic. So they're calm and they're passive. They don't do too much. You see, they lay back. And the sanguine. The sanguine is positive and outgoing because he's got too much blood. His blood pressure is too high. So he's got the springtime temperament. And then the choleric. He's always angry and determined because he's got too much green bile in him. See, choleric is, is bile, choleric, it's a Latin word. Anyway, melancholic is another colic thing, which is black colic. And it's a sad and introspective person because they have too much black juices in their body. Now, that's very easy, but which one are you? You got to pick one of the four. Because it turns out in modern psychology, they basically say these four kinds of temperaments, however they were found out, turns out it's not about the humors or the juices in me. But it's true that basically there are these four types. So now let's go over each one of them because I want you to see what a hard time Jesus has trying to get into you and become your treasure. Because every one of you is a whack job. You're all neurotics. All right, let's look. All right, here we go. Ah, the first guy. Good old Mr. Sangman, right? Yes. He's an outgoing leader. He's positive. He's initiator. He's extravagant. Very emotionally motivated. And just picture Peter, and you got the sanguine guy. Got high blood pressure. David, another sanguine guy. Praising God, weeping before God. He's emotional, but he's a leader. Come on, guys, we can do it. This is, this is the sanguine guy. Is that you? Let me move on to the next. Now, this is Mr. Phlegmatic. Now, he's laid back, he's calm, but he's cooperative. He stays in the background, but he's very dependable and faithful. That would be like Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, see? Or Barnabas, Paul's guy in the background. Or Timothy, even more in the background. The, very, uh, the positive traits are this, very conscientious, very patient, very cautious. Now, of course, the sins of such a person is they can be passive, lazy, unmotivated. Hmm, I see a couple of bells ringing on that one, huh? 
So she's a lazy one. As some of you already drift off into a slight sleep here at 7.30 at night. The next guy, the choleric guy, <laughs> the determined leader, he presses on. He never quits. He's a doer. He's motivated by a strong will. It's what you, if you were a child that was called by your parents a strong-willed child, hmm, I think you got some choleric juices going in you there somewhere. But that's like the Apostle Paul, total choleric guy. That was his temperament, but he was, man, you couldn't stop him. And so, so, you know, hit him, hit him 39 times, he still is alive. If he has to go in the, swim across a river, fine. He goes over there and he preaches in a wet tunic on the other side. You can't stop this guy. And, and also Martha. Martha was another one. Determined to do the best she could. The positives are they're direct, they're assertive, they're leaders, they get things done. If you got a cleric in your group, you get things done, right? Of course, their sins are they can be impatient, they get kind of angry, and they are the most stubborn people in the world. Oh, I hope none of you are that kind of a mule. I think some of your parents are saying, oh, Lord, kick that mule. <laughs> She's so stubborn. But that's because you're a choleric. You were born that way. The shape of your soul, you see. Well, let's take the fourth one then, the melancholic. Oh, poor old sad Joe. It's actually because his soul is deep. So nothing is easy for the melancholic. Everything takes time. It's been involved. It's exhausting. It's... But he's thoughtful. He's careful. He's conflicted many times. Very artistic often. Motivated by logic and a sense of right and necessity. Elijah. You remember Elijah. Sitting under the tree saying, Lord, take my life. There's no reason for me to stay here anymore. And the Lord sends an angel and the angel smacks him and says, hey, eat this, eat this uh, porridge and just go on. Uh, or then there's Jeremiah. What's Jeremiah called? Weeping Jeremiah. Why? Because he's always crying. Could that be you? Cry, baby? Oh, you take John, John the Apostle, very thoughtful, very deep. The other guys, Peter, just as shallow as a, you know, well, very shallow. But John, he's really deep. He's seeing the I am, but they're very steady. They're very supportive. Of course, their sins are they can get critical or get depressed. <laughs> now, which one are you? Well, we have to, here's a picture, so you decide. You take all those traits, put them together. I, I can tell you what, you're a difficult person. Whichever one you choose to be. Because, listen, here's the deal. People are usually found to have a dominant and subdominant temperament, which means you may be choleric in the dominant, but you may be phlegmatic in the subdominant. Most people aren't just one, but they're this with the that. Which makes the equation, you know, to, it just makes it a lot more difficult. Uh, number two, the shape of our soul is our lifelong personality, which gets influenced by the grace of God, or by sin, or by our outward circumstances. But God sovereignly shapes each one of us, independent of what your temperament is, with a great plan and purpose in mind which we discover by grace in our life of transformation. So much about our lives that's confusing to us, and especially at your age, starts to work itself out as we live our life with the Lord. He begins to transform us. Now, if any of you are interested in following this up any further, there's a wonderful book, actually. It's more than a million seller called The Spirit-Controlled Temperament by Tim LaHaye, one of those left-behind guys. But he is a psychologist, a Christian psychologist, and uh, it, it's a whole book about this. These are legitimate categories to think about. Now we leave that all behind to get to this. What does David mean when he says we are fearfully and wonderfully made? All right, here we go. David's discovery is that each one of us is made by God with the unique capacity to know Him. It's, it's an amazing thing. I mean, you think, all, you think of all those 12, 12 disciples, they got to have all four of those major temperaments. They're all complicated people, 
right? Uh, the doubting Thomas, he's so doubtful, he's got such a complicated mind. Yet God breaks through to everybody because he knows how wonderfully and fearfully and uniquely you're made. So you see, so he knows just how he can find a way to somehow share his treasure with you. Now listen, I know that this is very difficult for us to understand. God wants to share his life with you so much more than you even want to receive it. Uh, we're, we're, we're all here. I know that you're here this weekend because you want to know more about the treasure of Christ. Otherwise, what a wasted weekend. But here you are. And I'm so glad you're here. And I want to tell you that it doesn't make any difference if you're, what your personality is. God has a way into your life. Like it says later on in one thir Psalm 139, in that same psalm, he, David says this, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they'd outnumber the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. God has, God is always thinking about you. David says, I wake up in the morning, whether I'm escaping from King Saul, or whether I'm in a cave, or whether I'm just feeding the sheep, I get up in the morning and I realize, somehow I realize, God's been thinking about me all night. How can I show myself to this dear child? Isn't that a wonderful revelation to realize? As complex as David was, and you know he's a very complex person, he certainly wasn't perfect. But of course, the one thing he had was what? A heart. A perfect heart. And you know what God needs? A perfect heart, right? All right, so, so here's what happens with Christ our treasure. Somehow, at new birth, when you're born again, someone silently slips unaware into our inner man. You probably didn't realize it when you accepted Jesus. It's not like you felt something. But he quietly came inside. And now our greatest challenge is going to be mining deeply enough to see the glory of our abiding lover. So now here's Christ in you from the moment of new birth. But here's your challenge to dig down through some layers in order to see him in a new way. Just a moment, just a touch, it's all it takes. But that's what we do. You remember how Jacob, uh, Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 31, he says, the Lord appeared to Jacob from afar. So there's Jacob. How far was Jacob away from God? He, was, he wasn't even in the Canaan land. He was so far out. He was in Padanaram, wherever that is. I think it's pretty somewhere deep in New Jersey. But anyways, he was far from God. But here's what God said. Jehovah appeared to Jacob from afar, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And therefore, I've drawn you with loving kindness. So here's God. You're trying to find him. Meanwhile, he's going like this. Anybody know? What, some of you don't know what that is. That's me trying to be a fisherman, right? God is trying to find you, trying to find what bait you're going to go for. Everybody here, because of your personality, goes for a different kind of bait. It's strange. Somebody you read a book and they say, ah, I saw God. You read the book and you say, how can you, you turn it upside down? You can't even figure out what that book said. Somebody heard a song and came to Jesus because they heard a song. Somebody was deep and depressed. And they cried out to God for, for deliverance. And God met them. That's how they met God. See, everybody has a place. But as God said, Jacob, you were so far away. But I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now, let's see. How long does everlasting love last exactly? Hmm. Now, or put it another way. When's God going to give up on you? Hmm. Got a long time there. So, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I've drawn you with loving kindness. <laughs> Thank God. You know, again, this is so hard to talk about because of one thing. 
you just don't know, you just don't know yet how much he loves you. You just don't know. If you knew, you'd be crazy in love with him. Just crazy in love with him. But you don't know. You're, you're, still, you're still afraid. You're still afraid because of your sins. You're still trying to hide half the time and going through all these complicated things, you know. It's okay. It's okay. And so we're going to look at exploring the glory of God. <laughs> you know what? It's glory that attracts the minor, right? See, man was created to be a minor. You, you heard that this morning. Basically, Lucio, I wish he talked about it, how Adam and Eve went over to those four different rivers and, and were mining for gold and bdellium and the, the onyx and all those other things. You see, man was made to be a miner. Why? Kids get like beautiful things. So what attracts you? Beautiful stuff. I mean, even if it's an in-and-out burger, if that's what beautiful is to you, you're attracted. You'll be back. You see, it's the glory of something that attracts the minor. It, because the glory of God is greater than gold, isn't it? It's heavy with value. You know the Old Testament word for glory? And the glory came down. You know what that word actually is in Hebrew? Kavod. And you know what kavod actually means in Hebrew? Heavy. Back in the Jesus people days, back in the 1970s, when we, when we touched God, when we were worshiping, had a wonderful time, or somebody preached a great mission, message, you said, hey, how was that message? And the guy says, heavy, man. Heavy. Glorious. Glory is something heavy. See, like gold and silver. You have heavy stuff. Glory has substance. You see, you think, you think that the paper is great. Then you find gold. Say, hmm, paper, gold. Here's a paper dollar bill. Here's gold. Better yet, here's crypto. No, wait, crypto's imaginary anyway. Wait a minute. Gold, gold, get, get heavy. I can feel it. I put it in my pocket, makes a hole in my pocket, but it's worth a lot of money. Right? Glory is what attracts. It's heavy with value. It's beautiful to behold. It's frightening when first seen. The glory of God, you see I have that there, that little phrase in Latin, which all of you are students of Latin, I'm sure. Mysterium tremendum. Let me put it in another way. Mysterium um, 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 tremendum. Um, um, um. And it means, it's a, it's a theological term. The glory of God is so full of tremendous mystery that at the one hand... We are frightened when we see it. And on the other hand, we are magnetically drawn to it. Now, listen, and that's when you, when you see in the Bible, all these guys like Moses, he saw the glory of God, or Isaiah, he saw the glory of God, or Jacob, he saw the glory of God. And what happens to them? On the one hand, they say, ah, no, don't, don't, don't come any closer. And then and on the other hand, he says, oh, wait, I want to see that some more. Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. Go ahead, take me out, but I want to see your glory. I've been so attracted. You just handed me little glory hors d'oeuvres. See, Jesus gave parables on earth, and they were just glory hors d'oeuvres. This is the way the kingdom is. It's glorious. Oh, this is the way I am. It's glorious. This is, this, this. You know, he's trying to get our thirst going. But when you really meet the Lord, which side of that thing are you on? Are you the kind of person who's still kind of afraid of God? Or have you seen enough of the glory of God, like John says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Ah, glory is beautiful. But, here's an interesting phrase. For all of you, because all of you are kings and priests in the makings. And so even though, I mean, you are, there's female kings as well as male kings. But here is the Proverbs verse. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, specifically his glory. I won't go into the matter. It doesn't really mean that. But the glory of kings is to search out the same thing. So God hides something. Now who's going to be a king? Who's going to rise up? Who's going to search? Who's going to consider? Who's going to search out? You know, this is why David was truly... A man after God's heart, because he was a searcher. 
right. I am a seeker for God's heart of gold. David sang that song every day. So he went down into the God mines. Okay. All right. So now the Bible mentions one place where we can treasure Christ. It's joined to both soul and spirit. It's where we really live. It's the junction box of all your spiritual wiring. Have you ever seen a house being built or repaired by an electrician? You know what that is? That's an aluminum box like this. And in there is a whole bunch of electric wires. And that thing's called a junction box because the lights the wire is there and the, uh, the overhead the wire is there and the fan wire is there. It's all connected at that junction box. And you and I have a junction box and that's where God wants his treasure to dwell. That got junction box is your heart. Christ in you, the heart of the matter, right? So, we read some scriptures, right? Your word have I treasured in my heart. Matthew 6, 21. Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be. 2 Timothy 1, 14, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Well, that doesn't say heart, but that's what Paul's talking about. There's a place for the treasure chest. It's the heart. Okay, now here we go. we got to look at the heart for just a second, because it's important to understand why the heart is so important. I, I really fear that we don't understand how important if you knew how important your heart is, you'd take much more care of it. You'd guard it much more. We just throw our hearts around and make our hearts open to all kinds of terrible stuff. But listen to these scriptures. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's what the Lord's looking for. 1 Samuel 6, 17. The Lord sees not as man sees, for man looks on the outward, but the Lord looks on the heart. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Proverbs 3, 5, 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Heart, 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 heart. A lot of times we're trying to cosmetically fix up our outer man, even our soul. But God's looking deeper. So... Where does his heart fit in? Now, here's a diagram which Dr. Phoebe gave me here, she, being an expert in these things right here. Uh, how does the heart fit in here? Now, the heart sits between the soul and the spirit. The soul is the upper red stuff. The spirit's that white thing down there with the little candles in this particular uh, thing. And it's, just, it's a strategic part of your personality. Here's the soul, here's the spirit, here's the heart. It's the junction box, see? The heart makes all the key choices in your life. And the heart makes a decision when mind, will, and emotions have gotten together to make a decision. It's very important to know. And so, it says in Proverbs 4.23, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It means that the central headquarters of what you do in your life is your heart. That's why you need to guard it. It's a very important component of your life. Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings out good. The evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart. Ah, so our hearts can be good or evil. Depends, have treasure either way. It's very important, right? Sorry, didn't put that scripture in there. All right, here we go. Just to mention the heart and salvation. Perhaps there are some here who haven't received the Lord yet. Let me just explain what's going on here. Right? Now, when our mind, which is part of our soul, hears the gospel, and faith comes by hearing the word, truth and light begin to sound appealing to us. It begins to make sense somehow. There's our mind. It's thinking about the gospel that we've heard, right? But... Now, the love of God stirs our soul's emotions. Then we feel the desire to know this loving Savior. And then the will, which is all the way down there in the small and large intestines, as you can see, that's where the will abides. 
That's why they always kind of say, even in the Old Testament, when your will is determined to do something, you feel that feeling in your gut. Your will wants to do something. Your will feels the conviction of sin and wants to, wants to, it feels like he's got to decide something by the Holy Spirit. But only, only when the will, mind, and emotions are joined together in the heart does faith make a decision. Therefore, what does that famous scripture say? Therefore, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart. Now, you see, it's possible to believe something in your mind, but it hasn't changed your life. Or you can go to a service and hear worship and really get your emotions stirred up, but your life hasn't changed. Or you can read a good Christian book and say, you know what, I'm going to be like that missionary. But that doesn't change your life. But when your mind and your emotions and your will get together, that's when faith is action, because faith is in action. When somebody really believes the Lord, they take an action and their life is changed. When somebody just believes in the Lord, but there's no change, it's something mental, but it didn't get to the heart. A heart faith is what the Lord's looking for, right? So here is this place between these two realms, the body and the soul over here and the spirit over here and the heart is in the middle. Right? The heart stands as the battleground and the crossroad. Will the, what will you fill the heart with? See, it's your choice. And you've got two sources of supply. Basically, you can fill your heart with with stuff in your soul, your things that you're thinking about, things that you're inclined toward emotionally, or you can fill your heart with things from your newborn again spirit. Your choice. Which one will you do? Right? It can be influenced either by the soul or the spirit. It can be either deceitful or pure. So you know the scriptures that say our hearts are deceitful above all things. And yet, the scriptures also say that when you become a Christian, you receive a new heart, a pure heart. But it's still your choice on what you're going to do with that most important part of your spiritual anatomy. It is the center where God looks and responds to your life. So God looks at your mind and says, oh, you're very smart. That's great. He looks at your emotions. Oh, you're very emotional about me. That's great. But man, God looks at the heart and says, what have you decided at the core of your being? What's your direction at the core of your being? And so you see, heart means everything, ladies and gentlemen. It is the most important part of your life and probably an area that you've been neglecting or don't realize it's that important. Right? Just some scriptures here, Acts 4.32. The congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Boy, God can do something with a congregation that's of one heart and soul. Acts 8.37. Philip said, what, what must I do to be saved? The eunuch says, and Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. You see what, Paul, what Philip was getting at? Now, do you believe with your heart, or is this just something emotional, eunuch? And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he was baptized. Acts eleven twenty three, 23. When they arrived and witnessed the grace of God, Barnabas rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart. Ah, Barney was a very encouraging guy. You know why? Because he had a heart for the Lord. And when he shared things, it encouraged people. Because he had such a heart of encouragement. That's why he was called Barnabas, which is what? Bar, son, Nabas encouragement because when he spoke he spoke from the heart wonderful all right now how christ dwells in our heart we'll just spend a few moments probably you're going to go through this a few few times during this weekend but here we go pick one of these wonderful scriptures where paul prays that, he, that god would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith.
So we see something right away here, right? The Spirit cannot build the treasure of Christ in you if your inner man is weak. First, the Holy Spirit has to strengthen your spirit. Now notice that he's praying to the God of glory. It's the glory of the Lord that comes into us. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. But you're saved and the Holy Spirit's come into you. But Christ doesn't live there yet. He doesn't dwell in your heart there yet. Well, he's there by his spirit in your spirit. But now that spirit has got to build Christ into your heart. As another translation says there, be strengthened with power that Christ may make his home in your hearts. So you see, he's not automatically there. Have you made your heart his home? Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to build the treasure of Christ, the indwelling Christ into your heart? This takes some time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this takes some time. And thank God we have the Holy Spirit always working away inside us. See, we all want this treasure of Christ, but we got to understand how important it is for the Holy Spirit to have his way to build Christ into our hearts. And so we pray, search my heart, O Lord. Where's your heart? Distracted by many things? Uh, is your heart into this meeting tonight or not? Is your heart into the Lord? Where's your heart? Notice it says, you must love the Lord with all your heart. That means you're all, you're all in, right? That's the way consecration by faith works. The whole spirit, soul, and body are given to God. It's the first great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Consecration, Romans 12. Our brother shared it this morning. You all know that. Presenting your body as a living sacrifice. But ladies and gentlemen, if you don't present your heart to the Lord, say, oh Lord, search me and know my heart, know my ways. See if there's some secret way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. I want life. I want glory. I want Christ. He's ready to be built in your heart if you'll give the Lord your heart. That's the question. Watch me knee made this famous statement, and it's quite a strong statement, but nevertheless, uh, very wonderful. Uh, Josh, will you read that for us? Sure. In order for the inner man to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, the children of God must discharge their responsibility. They need to yield specifically to the Lord, forsake every doubtful aspect in their life, be willing to obey fully God's will, and believe through prayer that he will flood their spirit with his power. Amen. You know, he was a, a good-looking guy, wasn't he? He was a very, you could see there's a, there's a brightness in his eyes and a, and, and a love expressed in his heart. But what is he saying? Once again, ladies and gentlemen, have you offered your heart to the Lord? Allowed the Lord to work in there by the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit's indwelling you now. He's ready to build, ready to do things. So, we come to this matter of guarding our hearts. Wonderful Proverbs verse, right? Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Right? Okay. Now, I believe you're here because you treasure Christ. Right? But unless you guard your heart above all else, guard your heart above all else, it becomes a distracted heart, right? Right? You begin to leave your first love. The Lord that you loved last year, now you're a little cold because your heart's gotten distracted. See, that's the problem right there. You're not loving the Lord with all your heart. Right? And so this commandment, the very first commandment, why, why go on to the second or talk about anything else? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, soul, strength. So... So we have to guard our hearts above all else. Hmm. Inside you, the heart is the only treasure chest where you can keep all you have come to know of Christ. What are these treasures of Christ? What is it that you treasure Christ? What does this mean? There is a growing number 
of experiences that you have with Jesus Christ that are very <clears throat> precious. And so you keep them in your heart. He's answered prayer. He's forgiven you. He's drawn you. He's shown you some light. He's helped you find a friend. He's helped you through a difficult time. All of these are precious treasures that you're to put in the treasure chest of your heart. You see, the mind forgets. Jesus did something for you last week. Already your mind may have forgotten it. Our emotions kind of dull and can die out. Or our will becomes weak. But if we can treasure things in our heart, uh, then we can uh, keep these pre things precious. And they remain precious to us. So guard through the Holy Spirit these treasured moments. It's talking about moments, isn't it? It's talking about times the Lord came and met you and talked to you. You know, the Lord does speak to you. But you have to give Him time. You have to give Him space. You have to give Him place in your heart for Him to speak to you. He speaks in the heart when we hear, have a heart of faith. So, so here you go. Do you have junk in the trunk of your heart? Now, your heart has a limited capacity. It's taking in all kinds of stuff from the world. It's taking in all kinds of stuff from the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit. It only has so much capacity. And the trouble is that our, our treasure chest in our heart just gets jammed up. I tell you, I've never seen the generation where stuff like TikTok and social media so absolutely possesses people's time. You know, I, I read something today, and they said most uh, uh, Gen Zers are on social media nine hours a day. And they said, but that was several years ago. It's much more now. I mean, what, 10 hours a day? I mean, it's almost your whole sleeping time, you know? But uh, maybe the junk is video games. Maybe the junk is uh, show binging. My, my granddaughter... She lives in the city, but she doesn't know the Lord. She came by the other day. She was talking. She says, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw that series, some series, a police series that came out 10 years ago. She says, yeah, I, I've uh, binged it for the third time through. I mean, th this is like 50 episodes. How can you binge something 150 times? Dear girl, what are you doing with your life? What kind of a life is that, Honestly. Or maybe it's pornography. You know, that snags a lot of people, boys and girls. Or there's a romance and dating. Oh, I'm so in love with the Schmedley. But the Schmedley is a turtle or whatever it is. It is total, total dating preoccupation. I got to go in and get some cosmetic surgery. Or I want them to twist my nose upside down so I can look like a turtle. I'm just, uh, and people think about this, oh, how they look all the time. They're just obsessed with this kind of stuff. Or maybe it's sports. Or maybe it's just chatter, gossip, trolling. That's one thing. <laughs> Start chatter, goes down, the gossip gets to troll. Or there's fear, anger, unforgiveness, hatred. Or there's just any kind of obsession. Why is it that everybody's obsessed with one thing? What's happened? But you know what? If you're obsessed with stuff, your heart is full of junk. Now, it isn't all bad stuff, is it? I mean, you know, I mean, sports, hey, that's fine. But you can overdo it, right? Now, what do you think? If you, now listen, so you say you want to know the treasure of Christ, then I'm telling you something that's true. Whether you do something about it or not is up to you. You got to get rid of some stuff. You got to get rid of some junk in your life. It doesn't allow you the time to hear the Lord, to be with the Lord. He's your treasure, but he's not just going to show up if you're not going to show up to him. You're going to have to give something up. I, I know the perfect life is now that somebody can get saved and now live the American dream. So when a teenager becomes a teenager, first, on Monday they have violin lessons. On Tuesday they go to sack the pressure. On Wednesday they do taekwondo. On Thursday they, uh, um, name it, what, oh, they go to the, what's the name of that special math class? Yeah, yeah, they go to that. And then on Friday, 
They go to the mall. I, I don't know. But do you see what I'm saying? Well, where's time for the Lord? Oh, I don't know. I don't have time for the Lord. And poor moms and dads, you know, they're putting 60,000 miles on their car a year just driving us out to crazy stuff. Listen, I want you be the, to be the best soccer player you can be in your school. But you can't also be in the drama club and sing in the choir and uh, play violin the, over here and, and, and be in a special math group and go upstate New York to be in the leadership uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, all that stuff may be good, but you pile it all in together, and it's the world. And all that stuff, like Lucio said, is a beautiful flower that's been cut. And sooner or later, it's just going to wilt and die. How about the treasure in your heart? What do you got in there, huh? All right, well, here we go. Let's put some good stuff in there, huh? How about this? Your word have I treasured in my heart. How about some time with the word? I'm not saying, you know, I, I mean, I know, you know, the perfect thing is for you to get up at six o'clock in the morning, and have a one hour devotion, and then uh, and brush your teeth and go to school. I know that's not going to happen. But you need to open up your Bible, and have a short prayer. Actually read, think, and pray, right? All right, well, here's another one. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. How about hiding hidden things between you and the Lord? When the Lord answers your prayer, and the Lord forgives you, stick that in the trunk. How about this? Every disciple of the kingdom of heaven brings out of his treasure things new and old. Things he's done for you in the past. How does that happen? You know how it happens, ladies and gentlemen? I think that for somebody, especially when they're young and getting, getting Christ into their hearts, keeping a journal is really important. I'm not going to ask you how many keep a journal. And it's not like you have to keep a journal a day. Now, I'm not talking about a diary. Yeah, today I saw Schmedley over at Chick-fil-A, and he put so much junk on his chicken, I couldn't stand it. So gross. No, I'm not talking about a diary. We're talking about a journal of times I met with God. You'll be surprised. You'll be a surprise. You'll be amazed by how many times he answers a prayer that you prayed back last month and forgot all about. And you open your journal and say, oh, wow. You know, it's because our minds are like sieves. You know? I tell you, you know, I, I'm such an old guy now. You know, every, once, one day a week at least I forget my name. <laughs> Not really. But you see what I'm saying? Journal the stuff treasures new and old yeah i remember when the lord did this well how do you remember that because the devil he, you know he's got the devil's got one of those things like they had on them oh what's it with uh, you know where they found aliens all the time men in black the devil has one of those little uh, lights oh i forgot everything i went to that meeting that weekend and flesh it was so wonderful what happened i don't know I, I, i've been gone for three days where was it mm -hmm. He's got one. What are those things called? Neuralizer. A neuralizer. <laughs> the devil's got a neuralizer, man. He's just waiting to look at, have you look at him in the eyes. <laughs> Take all your memory away. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. Here's another one. Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You should journal down every time the Lord reveals something to you. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous thing. Just think about it. The Lord has spoken to you. Write down that little wisdom that you receive from him, right? Here's another one. Instruct them to do good and to be rich in good works, storing up for themselves a treasure for the future, which takes us into tomorrow, so I don't want to go there. But it's talking about good works, doing unto others as you want them to do to you, helping people. Store that up. It's treasures in your life. Or how about this? A little time for prayer. How often do you spend a day praying? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask you to spend 15 minutes a day praying. Even if you spend 10 in the morning and then in the afternoon, 30 seconds, then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 30 seconds, and in the evening, one minute. I'm, I'm serious. That's how we dialogue with the Lord, and we find many, many treasures of the things the Lord speaks to us. Now, here's another thing. How about a little worship time? You just go quietly into your bedroom. He says, go into your closet, close the door. What do you do? Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! 
well, you probably wouldn't do that. But you say, God, I love you today. Just want to spend one minute. You know, that song we said the other day, I've turned my back upon the world with all its idle pleasures, set my heart on better things, higher holier treasures. Lord, when I sang that song, it touched me. I just wanted to tell you, you're my treasure today. Amen. Got to go. It was a worship time. Legit. And some of you don't have a voice. But anyway, now it's, it's even more wonderful if your family has a family altar. I know, in principle, as a teenager, you must resist family altars. But if you're in such a family where they get together, open the Bible, have a prayer together every day, it's one of the blessings of your life. And everybody I know who was raised that way, when they grow up, do that in their homes. Because they remember how life-altering it was and how closely it kept the family together to read the Bible together, to talk about it and pray together. It's a wonderful treasure for our lives. Where do we got it? Oh, one more. You should have good times with your Christian brothers and sisters. I liked it. I think last year, maybe it started or two years ago, where some of you got in touch with each other by email and you kept emailing or, or, or Zooming each other or, or FaceTiming each other as the year went on. I think that's a great thing. That's what Paul tells Timothy. You know, get together with others who call on the Lord with a pure heart. It's one way to strengthen and put those treasures in your heart. Well, yeah, we go. Next time we'll talk about treasures in heaven, but that's all the time we have for tonight. And, uh, once again, I just want to say a couple of things. Number one, take seriously how important your heart is. And think about what you need to get, the junk you need to get rid of that's in your heart now. You really do. You just, sometimes our heart is so full of stuff that our hearts become evil. Remember, the, the writer of the Hebrews was talking to Christians when he says, you should never have an evil heart of unbelief. But that comes because I didn't believe, I didn't believe, I didn't obey, I didn't believe, I didn't believe. My heart turns dark. We need a single eye heart that keeps looking at Jesus. We need to say, like we sang the song, I've got a treasure within me. It was helping me to keep Jesus on the throne of my heart. Jesus, I, I put you on the throne of my heart. Jesus, you are king of my heart. I come to you, I enthrone you now. Ladies and gentlemen, you have some homework tonight to spend some time in your heart with the Lord. Lord, I'm so thankful we could get together. I know during the weekend we'll be talking about a lot of treasures. But Lord, I want to say that to me it's a miracle that you treasure our hearts so much. That you love us as individuals and you're trying to get to the very core of our being to transform us and change us into the likeness of Christ himself. We want Christ to be built in our hearts. But Lord, we, we need to bow before the Holy Spirit and allow him to do sometimes the drastic work that needs to be done where we allow the Lord to be built in our hearts. And we turn from unrighteousness to righteousness, from unlove to love, from darkness to light. Oh, Holy Spirit, work in the lives of your dear children, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.